Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 1-5. Still, still in this chapter on protests. It, it is admittedly a long one, uh, but we're, we're going to finish it up in this recorded lecture. So we've been going through these six supergroups of eukaryotes. We've only got two left, but they're two of the bigger ones. Uh, so let's turn our attention now to the biggest of these, uh, a supergroup called Chrome alveolata. So, uh, Chrome alveolata. Members are photosynthetic, although some members have lost this ability. So, the the ancestors to this group were photosynthetic, but it, and this is another confounding you know thing that can happen evolutionarily. Uh, not everyone in this group has the ability to do photosynthesis. Uh, we're going to see this in, in other more relatable groups later on, you know, birds that have lost the ability to fly, uh, or vertebrates that have lost some or all of their four limbs. Uh, yeah, evolutionarily, this group is photosynthetic, but not everyone in this group does it because they've lost it evolutionarily. Now, this is such a large group well, you could actually divide this supergroup even further into two other clades, uh, alveolates and straminopiles. Let's do this alveolates next. So this is under the supergroup of chrome alveolata, and this, if you want to be generic, you know, I, I talked about the domain, kingdom, phylum, all that stuff, but uh, sometimes you, you could just call something a clade, uh, and that's just the only way to do it. This clade alveolata or alveolates um, includes several other groups, so we're under both of these umbrellas. Again, I find this to be um, perhaps a useful visual if you're trying to take in some of this information that, yeah, dinoflagellates are alveolates, they're also chrome alveolata, they're also eukaryotes. So whatever you need to look at to, to make this click with your brain. So, okay, what are dinoflagellates? Well, dinoflagellates are mostly marine, meaning they live in salt water. Uh, they're plankton. So we're going to see plankton come up several times in this chapter and other chapters. Uh, plankton is not a species of thing. Uh, it's not a group of thing. Plankton is a lifestyle. Uh, so the key terms define plankton as a diverse group of mostly microscopic organisms that drift in marine and freshwater systems and serve as food for larger aquatic organisms. The key part of that definition is drift. Plankton are organisms that go with the flow, that don't really actively swim from place to place, just go where the movement of water takes them. And again, most plankton is microscopic, but there, there's some uh, macroscopic plankton uh, as well. So dinoflagellates have this, this lifestyle, this planktonic lifestyle, as it's called. Uh, and there are a few interesting notable members. Uh, some of them uh, produce toxins, are, are responsible for this uh, red tide uh, algal bloom, this uh, photo here taken from Florida. Very dangerous to be in or near this water. It looks very beautiful, but, um, well... Actually, it looks kind of grim, like it's filled with blood or something, but uh, these are toxins produced by dinoflagellates. Don't want to be anywhere near that. Um, on a much lighter note, uh, some dinoflagellates are bioluminescent, uh, meaning they, they produce their own light. So here's a, a cool bay showing these, uh, you know, washing up against the shore. There are other cool pictures and videos of these. Sometimes their, their bioluminescence is a defense mechanism, so they'll light up when they are disturbed. Uh, and so there are cool videos of boats going through waters with these dinoflagellates and leaving behind them a wake of bioluminescence, really cool stuff. So these are just some of the notable members. Some produce toxins in water, what we call red tides, some are bioluminescent. And there's another notable um, member or, or group of members within dinoflagellates. Uh, some are photosynthetic partners of corals. So we will see this exact slide again when we talk about animals, uh, invertebrates, uh, but corals are a part of a group of uh, animals, uh, not protists, uh, but they have a symbiotic relationship with these 
algae, these protists, these dinoflagellates, allowing them to effectively do photosynthesis. So the protists, the dinoflagellates do photosynthesis, and the coral you know, gives them a safe place to, to live so they're not just floating around uh, and, and easy prey for other things in, in the marine ecosystem. So again, come back to this later when we talk about animals, but important to know now, some dinoflagellates are the that other half, the non-animal half of this uh, of this thing, the photosynthetic partners of corals. Okay, so that was dinoflagellates, another group within within Chromia alveolata, within alveolates, um, is apicomplexans. And uh, you know you're in for a wild ride when the group has complex as part of its name. Um, this includes uh, the parasite that causes malaria. And I mentioned near the top of this chapter that a lot of protists have complex life cycles, and woo boy is this an example of that. Um, we are not going to list these 10 steps. We are not going to, uh, to memorize all this stuff, but I, I put up this slide to show you just how complicated things can be. That You have stages of the mosquito, and you have multiple you have fertilization events and mitosis, and you have, have different stages here. This only takes place in the mosquito, uh, so the, the parasite needs to be in the mosquito. It's not just spread from mosquito as a convenient way to move it around. It has to complete several stages of its life cycle within the mosquito. And then within the human, you've got other types of division, and you've got different uh, schizon ring stages and other types of infection and going to different parts of the body and then making it back to the mosquito. It's complicated. So th this is, you know, just interesting to look at, but here's what I want you to take from this. Uh, members of this group, AP complexans, are all parasites uh, with complex life cycles. And, and you should definitely know the group here responsible for malaria because malaria has a huge impact on global public health, uh, Plasmodium SPP. Um, I think this is the first time uh, we've come across this. So we, we talked in the, the first chapter uh, in this course, the genus and species naming convention, the binomial nomenclature, Plasmodium here, of course, being the genus and SPP period. Uh, this doesn't mean a specific species. When you see this, it means several different species within this genus. So the, the abbreviation just means several species. Uh, Plasmodium falciparum is one that comes to mind, but there are several species which can cause malaria. So Plasmodium SPP, you see that, you should associate that with malaria. Okay, then there's one last alveolate, uh, a group called ciliates, uh, and again, the, the name says a lot about them. They've got cilia right in the name. They are covered in cilia. Here we go. So there's a, a microscope image. Um, again, they're single-celled, so they're obviously very small. And yeah, here's a, a cartoon that shows this a, a little more clearly, the cilia that covers their body. And uh, yeah, they swim around using this cilia, and, uh, and they eat eat uh, bacteria. Remember I told you that this group as a whole was, you know, photosynthetic, but uh, obviously, you know, some have lost this ability. Malaria parasites are not photosynthetic, and, and these ciliates are not photosynthetic either. So the ciliates are covered in cilia, and uh, they're heterotrophs that eat bacteria. So that was half of chrome alveolata, these three. Uh, the other clade within this clade uh, is stramenopiles. And if we want to talk about their distinguishing feature, they have hairy flagella, which, it, I mean, uh, he, there it is. Uh, so there's a flagellum with these the hairs attached to it. It's a weird phrase, but uh, yeah, it's a distinguishing feature of members of this, this clade stramenopiles within the supergroup Chrome alveolata. So there are several stramenopiles. Uh, so this, this group includes several other groups, one of which is called diatoms. So diatoms are also photosynthetic. Um, and very beautiful looking, if I'm being honest here. Lots of cool, unique shapes, uh, you know, triangles, circles, ovals, whatever you'd call this spiral, a star, that's very cool. Um, unique shapes here, to go to another image, here's another image just showing how 
you know, the diversity of these different shapes uh, that they can have. Uh, they are photosynthetic, they are planktonic, and they have unique complex shells made of silica. Uh, as a, a fun side note, if you're into uh, to crime drama or crime shows or, or things like that, the, these shells are so unique, different bodies of water uh, have different populations of diatoms with different with different unique shapes. So there have been in TV shows, but also in real life, uh, cases where you know a victim's body was found drowned, and you know they they looked at the diatoms in the lungs and, and found uh, that oh this this person must have been drowned in this lake in specific uh, because the diatoms from that lake had these unique shapes. So it's sort of piecing together the crime in that way. So that. Just a fun side note, but uh, there are unique complex shells of silica associated with these photosynthetic diatoms. Uh, another group of stramenopiles is golden algae. This is another photosynthetic plankton. Uh, instead of having shells, uh, what's special about the golden algae and so they can form branching colonies. So this isn't really a multicellular organism. It's a bunch of cells that are, you know, growing together to form a colony. But it's definitely something that diatoms, you know, don't do completely single celled here. So golden algae, photosynthetic plankton that form branching colonies. Now, uh, a very interesting strain that Opie will talk about next is brown algae. And I say this is very interesting because this is uh, one of those protists that most people don't know is a protist. Brown algae is kelp, or sometimes called seaweed. I think most people would look at this stuff, whether it's you know washed up on a beach or whatever, and identify it as a plant, because it looks a lot like a plant. I mean, it's, it's photosynthetic, it's green, more or less kind of greenish brown, but it's, it's more or less green, it's got these quote unquote leaves uh, that it has to do photosynthesis, it looks just like a plant. Um, evolutionarily, however, the way it does photosynthesis and, and, and everything, uh, it's not a plant. This is another example of convergent evolution. If you're doing photosynthesis and you're a multicellular organism, having this flat blade-like structure, a quote unquote leaf, is just a really good way to capture sunlight. So plants, uh, evolved leaves because it's a good way to do it uh, and independently these brown algae have a very similar body form because it's a good way to do photosynthesis. So uh, brown algae also known as seaweed also known as kelp are photosynthetic which isn't unique uh, but they're multicellular. It's been a while since we've seen a multicellular protist. I said at the top most of them are single celled and, and hopefully that's been that's been shown as I've gone through the chapter but this is one of the the rare multicellular protists and yeah they are superficially similar to plants. That's uh, a way to say that. And okay, finally, in stramenopiles, uh, one last group here, uh, oomycetes. Uh, so oomycetes are saprobes or parasites. So we, we know what a parasite is. Uh, a saprobe needs to be defined. Uh, it's in the key terms. An organism that derives nutrients from decaying organic matter. And again, that, that's sort of the MO of a fungus. Uh, these things uh, are superficially similar to fungus, meaning they look like a fungus. Here's an example of an oomycete. Uh, yeah, gross looking mold. Um, I've been assured there's a grasshopper underneath all this. Uh, apparently a dead grasshopper being, um, you know, being broken down and nutrients absorbed from it underneath this, this mess of stuff. Uh, this is another one of those protists that before uh, genetic sequencing and sequence alignment technology came along, it was uh, it was called a fungus. It was uh, part of uh, kingdom fungi. Uh, but anyway, they've, they've got the fungi lifestyle as saprobes, uh, or some of them are parasites. They look like a fungus, and they have a very famous member. Um, this is... Uh, well, this is a potato, uh, but it's a really gnarly messed up potato because it has been infected by 
Phytophthora infestans. That's quite the mouthful. Remember, there's no spelling required on my multiple choice exams. Uh, more commonly known as potato blight. Uh, so it doesn't look like much, uh, but this protist had a huge impact uh, on the world, really. It's responsible for the, the Great Famine in Ireland from 1845 to 1852, I think. About a million deaths and, and maybe two million Irish who fled the country to, for other parts of the world. Huge economic and political repercussions. This is not a history class, but, uh, you know, if you take a history class, a world history class, this will come up. And it's fun to note that it's not a fungus that was responsible for this, like most people would uh, would kind of assume or, or look at. Uh, this is a protist that's responsible for this blight uh, on the potato. So Phytophthora infestans, potato blight, it's one of these oomycetes, which is in the group of stramenopiles, which is in the supergroup of Chrome alveolata. All right, one last group here, almost finished with this. Uh, this is the supergroup called Excavata. Um, kind of a, a weird name, Excavata. Uh, these are single-celled organisms. Um, they are named for a feeding groove uh, that's present on their, their cells that someone thought it <laughs> looked like this this groove had been excavated from the side and so here's a, a cartoon we'll see some microscope images but it's easier to see in the cartoon there's a nucleus and there's a, a flagellum uh, and yeah here's the, the the feeding groove here uh, again someone thought it had been it looked like it had been excavated from the side of the cell, hence the name excavata, just you know, something to help you remember the name, even though it's kind of a weird stretch, but uh, that's, what they're, that's what they're named for. Um, excavata includes a group called diplomonads, and uh, okay, just again, the names often provide clues about things, and don't worry about monad, but, but die should mean something to you. Uh, die means two. So there's going to be something about these things that they have two of, and looking at these under the microscope should be pretty apparent. The thing they have two of is nuclei. Yeah, these kind of look like eyeballs. Remember, this is a single-celled organism. This is a nucleus, and this is a nucleus. So diplomonads, they have two nuclei. Uh, and actually, if you look more closely at these, if you, you know, sequence these genomes and, and examine them genetically, they're actually not identical. So these diplomonads have two non-identical haploid nuclei, uh, which is, is weird. I mean, we have, you know, two copies of each gene. We just put them in a single diploid nucleus. The reason why they keep their non-identical copies in two separate haploid nuclei is not well understood. Uh, th there's another more bizarre thing about them. Uh, they have reduced mitochondria. So if you remember, mitochondria were one of those, you know, basic fundamental things that all eukaryotes have. Um, they don't have them. Uh, and it's not that these are the, the most ancient, most basal eukaryotes there are. Uh, they've, they've reduced the function of their mitochondria. They've essentially lost most of this organelle. And again, we'll, we'll see this in later chapters as well. This is not unlike uh, birds that have lost the ability to fly, like penguins uh, or, or things like that. So they have reduced mitochondria called mitosomes. Uh, and a um, good member, you know, just a, an interesting member of note in diplomonads is Giardia lamblia. Uh, this is what we've been looking at here. Again, not much to really look at, some flagella, whatever. Uh, Giardia lamblia is responsible for uh, hiker's diarrhea. So if you're going hiking in the mountains and you see a, a beautiful, clear stream of water, uh, it may look beautiful and clear, but, you know, a deer may have pooped in it upstream, and there may be Giardia in there, you drink that, and, and you may be uh, suffering from the same thing that, that that deer did. So, anyway, Giardia lamblia, no notable member of, uh, of Diplomonads. 
So, okay, there are some other uh, excavata here other than diplomonads. Uh, one of, another group is parabasalids. Uh, and they've got the same thing going on, reduced mitochondria. And again, the reason for this uh, is not well understood why they would you know, go backwards from this evolutionary innovation that was uh, fundamental to eukaryotes and sort of reduce their, their function, not well understood. Uh, their cells are you know, not too much to, to look at. Um, you can kind of see the feeding groove there. Um, they have flagella to swim around, and this thing at the tip uh, might look like another flagellum. It's actually a structure called the axostyle, which is used for attachment, sort of stabbing into something and then keeping it in place. So parabasalids have flagella and an axostyle for attachment. Um, and yeah, attaching themselves to things might make you think that they would be very good parasites. That would be a good conclusion. Uh, a notable member of parabasalids is Trichomonas vaginalis, uh, responsible for trichomoniasis, a, a fairly common sexually transmitted infection. Uh, it's not terribly harmful on its own, asymptomatic about 50% of the time, uh, but it can increase susceptibility to other uh, sexually transmitted infections like HIV and, and can complicate childbirth and pregnancy. And so well, it's uh, pretty notable, uh, despite vaginalis being the uh, species name, uh, men can contract this infection as well. Um, but not all parabasalids are parasites. Another notable member, not you know for us, but another not notable member of parabasalids is Trichonympha. There's the SPP again, so several species here. Uh, Trichonympha. Uh, they live in the gut of the termite and digest cellulose. So uh, again, the single-celled organism is you know not really anything all that interesting, uh, but. This is the power behind uh, behind the termite. Uh, we're going to see in later chapters when we talk about the digestive system. Uh, no animal can really digest cellulose, can really break down leaves or grass or wood. Uh, any animal that makes its living eating that sort of plant matter, you know, whether it's a cow or a rabbit or a termite, every single animal that does that has to have some partner actually breaking down the cellulose for them. And in this case, uh, the termites are using this, these trichonympha SPP species uh, in their gut to digest this cellulose and the plant matter uh, that, they, that they are consuming. Okay, so these were both parabasalids. Uh, moving on, more excavata. Uh, the next group to talk about is euglenozoans. Uh, again, they have flagella. That's not really special here. There's a flagellum sticking out here. But um, there is something else if we look closely at this. So this, this reservoir here, this is essentially a mouth. So they use the flagellum, and there's, there's another shorter flagellum in here as well, to sort of reach out and grab uh, prey, bacteria, uh, and bring it into their mouth to eat. So these things are heterotrophs. They're swimming around. They're eating bacteria. But if you look you know, and all the other things labeled here, whoa, there's also a chloroplast. So these things are eating bacteria. They're also doing photosynthesis. These are, and I defined this at the top of the chapter, maybe you've been waiting for it to come up. Uh, most euglenozoans are freshwater mixotrophs. So there's the mixotroph term. Uh, they're heterotrophs and autotrophs. Very cool. Uh, at least cool to me. Uh, but not all of them are freshwater mixotrophs. I did say most. Uh, there is a very notable parasite within this group, Euglenozoa. So some of them are parasites. The notable member is uh, Trypanosoma brucei. Uh, responsible for African sleeping sickness. There's the trypanosome here in single-celled organisms, so not that interesting. And, whoa, here's the infection cycle. So, uh, again, I think malaria's got it beat as far as complexity goes, but this is another thing that the tsetse fly is spreading it, not a mosquito. But, you know, using the tsetse fly, you know, infecting a human, uh, this is... 
uh, a, a very horrible <laughs> disease to have, uh, causes a lot of neurological symptoms, including issues with sleep regulation, hence the name sleeping sickness. Uh, but yeah, you should uh, be aware that Trypanosoma brucei is responsible for African sleeping sickness, and it, it's a parasite uh, that is the in the group Euglenozoa. So it's not just freshwater mixotrophs, it's uh, some nastier stuff as well. So Okay, we're we're finally done. We finally finished out uh, this this whole table here. I mean, obviously we skipped plants, animals, and fungi. We'll come to those in, in their due time. But we have finished going through all the groups of protists. Uh, there's just there's just one last thing that I want to point out, um, and, and this is kind of a, a note. Uh, sometimes single celled heterotrophic protists are called protozoa. So obviously this word protozoa doesn't have any evolutionary meaning. It's just a, a catch-all umbrella term. I mean, I guess protists are already kind of a catch-all umbrella term, uh, but it's an even more uh, informal umbrella term uh, that, you know, scientists used to, and sometimes still do, that's why I'm pointing this out to you, used to describe uh, any of this stuff. So all these things should look familiar to you, the, the ciliates, the cholanoflagellates, amoeba of, of different shapes and sizes. Um, a single-celled protist that is heterotrophic can be called a protozoan. So uh, again, the, the field is moving away from this term because it doesn't have any evolutionary significance. Um, it's very arbitrary just to define what is and, and isn't here from an evolutionary standpoint. But I want you to be equipped with this knowledge because you, you may see this in other courses or other sources. Single cell heterotrophic protists sometimes apply to, to this term protozoa protozoans. Okay. Now, uh, this is uh, the end of the chapter on uh, protists, and it makes for a perfect cutoff for the end of this lecture. This uh, recorded lecture is a bit shorter than most of the others, but man, it, this one and the last one have just been packed with information, so I think it's fine for this one to be a little bit shorter. This is the end of recorded lecture 1.5, and you'll note this is also the end of the material uh, that applies to exam number one. So this is a cutoff for, you know, where exam number one material will end uh, at the end of this protist chapter.